A very good evening to you all, respected doctors. It's indeed my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all on behalf of IPCA for this very interesting webinar, Hypertension Summit. It's my proud privilege to welcome today's faculties of national and international repute. The entire session will be moderated by Dr. S.S. Iyengar, sir, who is known nationally by his, for his brilliant academics as well as clinical expertise. Currently, sir, is heading Department of Cardiology at Manipal Hospital at Bangalore. There will be two sessions, session one on combination therapy in hypertension management by Dr. P.B. Jaigopal, sir, from Palakkad, Kerala. And it will be chaired by Dr. Ajay Kumar Pandey, sir, from the sacred city of Varanasi. Session two will be of a panel discussion on hypertension treatment, what's new. And our esteemed panelists are Dr. Shiv Prasad, sir, from Aleppi, Dr. T.T. Paul, sir, from Trishur, Dr. Pramila Kalra, ma'am, from Bangalore, and Dr. Sanju Patak, sir, from Ahmedabad. I welcome you all, respected doctors. And before I hand over the session to respected Dr. Ayangar, sir, it's my honor to have a brief introduction of, sir, to you all viewers. Dr. Ayangar, sir, is a DM cardiology from Pune University and FRCP from Edinburgh. Sir is a consultant emirates and academic head, Department of Cardiology at Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. Sir was a physician to the Chief of Air Staff, Indian Air Force, New Delhi from 1978 to 1981. A cardiologist at Command Hospital, Air Force, Bangalore from 1987 to 1993. And professor and head cardiology at St. John's Medical College Hospital, Bangalore from 1995 to 2010. Sir is a recipient of Vishisht Seva Medal by the President of India in 1982. There is a Life Member of Cardiology Society of India, Fellow of Indian College of Cardiology, and there are more than 55 papers published in national and international journals. It's my honor to hand over the session to Dr. S.S. Iyengar, sir. Sir, please. Thank you, Mr. Avanash. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, thank uh, IPCA for organizing this uh, scientific uh, meeting on hypertension, uh, particularly during this COVID uh, season. All the more reason we should know more about hypertension because of this interaction between hypertension and COVID. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, our chairperson for the first session, Dr. Ajay Kumar Pandey, who is MD, DM, DNB, FACC and FACAI. He is Director of Cardiology at Galaxy Hospital, Varanasi. He is the program coordinator for PGDCC from IGNO. And he started many international uh, setups in uh, Varanasi, has done a large number of uh, international cardiology procedures, and uh, delivered many lectures, published many papers in national and international journals, and participated in many clinical trials. So it's my pleasure to request Dr. Ajay Kumar Pandey to introduce the topic and the speaker for the next session. Dr. Ajay Kumar. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Uh, I'm really uh, thrilled to have a part of this uh, academic session, which IPCA people has uh, organized. And uh, uh, but the first session is for the combination therapy in hypertension. And uh, I'm really um, uh, appreciate Dr. Jay Gopal, sir, who is a uh, director at HOD of Senior Interventional Cardiology at Lakshmi Hospital, uh, Palakkad, Kerala, and he is going to speak on this topic. Uh, he is a vice president of Indian College of Cardiology at present, an executive committee member of National Cardiological Society of India. He is a principal investigator and national coordinator of Heart Failure Registry of Indian College of Cardiology and is an editorial board advisory advisory board of Indian Heart Journal. He was a co-investigator in Create Registry and many you know, registries done in Kerala on, on acute coronary syndrome, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, primary angioplasty. So I welcome Dr. Jay Kopal, sir, to uh, take over the topic and guide to the audience. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. I'll share my screen in a second. Hope it's uh, visible. Yeah, it's yes, yes, yes. 
So uh, at the outset, let me thank the IPCA for having invited me to take part in this educational activity, this webinar. Um, my topic, of course, uh, this has been uh, talked more often. I think it's, it's about the uh, growing trend of combination therapy in the hypertension management. So over the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I think I'll touch upon uh, what the changing concepts are today. Uh, we all know that this is the, the combination therapy in hypertension has been there for a long time. Now, if you start looking at the uh, the prevalence of hypertension, there's no doubt that this is increasing everywhere, not only the worldwide increase, but also uh, even in India. We Today, we see that we are confronted with a very large percentage of, in fact, one of the studies that we did from the Cardiology Society, which was just a, a day's program, we got into the Guinness Book of Records for just documenting the highest number of readings in a day, which showed the prevalence in uh, to be very high. I mean, we this was a survey which was done, which showed about 30, 35% of the people who actually had a, uh, a blood pressure check had high BP. Moreover, I think the recently uh, uh, an article which has been published in the Lancet shows that the prevalence of hypertension is close to about 25%. So the problem is that two thirds of these patients with hypertension, they land up to the cardiologist or to the, or to the let's say even to the nephrologist, uh, neurologist with a, uh, acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, or even a, a, an acute stroke. And then this also leads on to a lot of uh, dailies, the uh, disability adjusted life years, which is, which is growing day by day. So I think one of the uh, most quoted uh, literature in the Indian scenario is by Anjana et al. This is in 2014. You find the prevalence is very high, what I spoke to you about. The prevalence is very high, what I spoke to you about. Uh, which, uh, which actually was uh, the, uh, the Lancet publication came out in 2018. But then here you could see that whether it's the north, uh, the it's east, it's or, the, or, this, or the south, the, the prevalence is uh, close to about 30%. And uh, what is even more distressing is the fact that uh, the control of hypertension is, is very dismally low. Now, uh, this is a recent publication which was actually in the 2019 circulation research, uh, American Heart Journal, where, where they, they found that the, the, there are a lot of discontinuous. Uh, one of the problems that you find that when you have hypertension is the adherence level. If you start looking at the age above 18 years, you find that as the uh, the various age groups, the adherence to therapy is very less. There is a high, very high discontinuation rate. And also, if you start looking at the, the data, even from the Western countries, the majority of the patients, even if you see the blood pressure, they are not they, they treated to the blood pressure goals as what is required. Uh, you see that in even a country like United States, the top European countries, Japanese countries, prevalent patients, not at goal. So though the diagnosis is much better than what we see, the prevalent patients, but not at goal is, is, is very high. So that is, this is one of the major problems that is confronting not only the uh, country like India, but all over the world. Now, if you start looking at the various reasons, reasons for the inadequate blood pressure control, you find that the non-adherence, which is what I uh, elucidated a little earlier, which I showed uh, alluded a little earlier as to the reasons, you see that maybe because of various reasons in a country like India, perhaps the most important thing is the cost of the drug. Again, the lack of understanding by the patients may be equally important and also the problem in the physician, in the patient's mind, not in the physician's mind, is about the drug-related side effects, which actually prevents the people from taking care. And of course, once in a while, you you confront this patient with resistant hypertension. When whatever you do, you're not able to you tackle the blood pressure in this patient. So the one of the main reasons, if you start looking into the the physician's problem, or let us say, what the physician is what the physician is confronted is the suboptimal control of blood pressure. 75% of the patients do not have ad adequate blood pressure control with the monotherapy. And that's where your combination therapy comes in. And that's where my talk is relevant today. Now, uh, why is it so? Why does a monotherapy not re is not really effective? Because we all know that the various drugs that you have, the, the, perhaps the most effective is a calcium channel blocker, whether it's a young age group, young age group or the elderly. It actually acts, acts on the smooth result cells. You know, the vasodilation is the major reason. The ACE or the ARB would act at the, at the renal level. And again, the vasodilate effect is also there. Diuretic 
though initially it actually has the chlorothalonil particularly though there is an effect on the on the uh, volume depletion and reabsorption of sodium essentially it acts it acts like a vasodilator later on it reduces the vasoconstriction so it's got varied effects in varied areas and when you use a combination therapy actually some of the problem that is seen for example when you use a uh, the calcium channel blocker there is a bit of a vasodilatation like the diuretic also and this actually would stimulate the ras further so if you were to add a calcium channel block uh, an ace inhibitor to this group that would add on to an additive effect and you would give you get a, a synergistic effect and better control of blood pressure again the same thing with with the ras also you use a combination the the sympathetic activity along with the calcium channel blocker is taken care of for example particularly the newer calcium channel blockers which has got an effect on the sympathetic nervous system so this actually would be complementary and then that synergistic effect actually leads on to a much better blood pressure control now the question is why so i think it's very clear that the multiple mechanisms are involved in the pathogenesis of hypertension and so when you use a combination therapy you are able to target these areas very well and the effectiveness which i had shown by monotherapy uh, is 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 very clearly seen so when you use a combination treatment the blood pressure comes down markedly uh, less the blood pressure control is markedly better the effective blood pressure control is seen only on 50% of the patients in monotherapy and when you subject these patients to a combination therapy there is a very high responder rate close to about 80% and the blood pressure goals which are difficult to attain with monotherapy in patients with diabetes or target organ damage is better with a with a combination therapy now as i had mentioned earlier let's look at this combination therapy you think this is a new concept no i think i am sure professor ayengar would also agree with me he has been in this field for such a long time uh, you know we are all very familiar with that molecule called adelphin acetrex in fact one of the first drugs for example you look at the ba cooperative study in fact one of the first drugs which were marketed was the serpine even today we still use this the the homeopaths use it the ayurvedic people it's either a sarpagandhi or revolfi or whatever you name it and then uh, it's what we used also allopaths also used once upon a time the combination therapy and which is very effective i tell you i have also used it initially in my years of practice it's a wonderful drug but then we all know that this combination therapy worked hydrolyzed hydrochlorothiazide hydrolyzine and reserpine were combined in a single tablet and found to be very effective i don't think we can ever deny this this fact now what really pushed this combination therapy is a is a trial which is the the accomplished trial where a ace inhibitor hydrochlorothiazide was compared to a calcium channel blocker and when they were used as a monotherapy the, the blood pressure control was only 37.2 or 37.9 the baseline but when they were combined the the agents were combined with either hydrochlorothiazide or the calcium channel with an ace inhibitor you see the market difference the, the control of blood pressure which is close to about 80% which i was mentioning about so i think the message is very clear combination therapy really works this is one of the largest trials and not only that this is one drug where when they when they found that you know this was one drug which also pushed the use of a combination therapy of calcium channel blocker plus ace inhibitor when they looked at the the primary endpoint we always keep talking about the outcome trial whether it is a statin whether it is sgl2 inhibitor or whatever so the outcome trials also the if you look at the total cardiovascular mortality whatever you see on the left hand side you see that it is beneficial the cardiovascular mortality the non fatal myocardial infarction the stroke unstable angina even revascularization procedures all these things made a remarkable difference when these people were on a combination of calcium channel blocker with ace so much so this is a very impressive 20% reduction i think this is one of the one of the major trials which actually uh, i mean uh, emphasized the point that a combination therapy is effective not only effective it also uh, brings down the hard end points let's also look at another trial in fact felodipine was a very favorite molecule for me once upon a time and unfortunately this is not available today and there is a trial called hot study hot study is more known for the reason where where, where it has established a lower level of diastolic blood pressure anything less than 82.5 in fact they came out with this was supposed to be not good for the heart so the jet curve hypothesis which crookshank brought in all this came in with the with the trial and what is interesting here is that when patients were on monotherapy what you see in the red and the if you wanted a blood pressure around 140 to 150 on combination therapy it was markedly better again if you wanted it less than 85 or less than 80 again the percentage of patients on a combination therapy had actually much better reduction in blood pressure again proving the point that combination therapy is effective 
Now let's also look at one another large trial, the Alha trial, where again the combination drugs were used, and they also followed up the patient for a very long period, not only one or two years, but even five years. And what was found that what you see in the bar above, the the green or mustard color there, is the more than more than three drugs, and the other one, the in red, is more than two drugs. I think a good variety of patients needed a combination therapy for control of high blood pressure. So the question was. But why is what why is why is this response so different? Is it because these patients were these patients not an optimal therapy of a single agent? I think the answer to that comes from this particular particular slide, where you know if you start increasing the dosage of thiazide, for example, if this is a, what you see in here is the uh, in double the, the and the combined. If you start increasing the dosage and you combine you you compare that with the combination, the amount of blood pressure blood pressure reduction ratio is markedly less even even if you combine or double the dosage of drug i mean even even if you increase the dosage double vis a vis a combination whether it's in a thiazide whether it's a base a beta blocker whether it's an ace or a calcium channel blocker all these things so the combination therapy is much better than doubling the dose of an individual drug and that again uh, gives us the answer that combination therapy is better i think now let's look into the this is a little old slide but i think let us also look into the impact of drug class on adherence i was mentioning earlier one of the major keys key factors one of the major factors in in the treatment of hypertension is the adherence to therapy and if you start looking at this the continuation rates at one year it's surprising that you know the the uh, a, a, a the calcium channel blockers is much less than the arb is arb is more often the most tolerated Prescription drug, and then the, you have the highest adherence rate, the ARB, slightly less with the calcium channel blocker. We would assume that the calcium channel are are more frequently uh, people are the patients are more adherent to that. But in the beta blockers and the and the diuretics were the lowest, understandably so. I think even from a physician's perspective today, if you were to look at the prescription patterns, ARB definitely scores over rest of the uh, agents. Now this is an ASH position article in combination therapy again, little long back. Where a low dose combination was found to be having increased efficacy and fewer side effects, again proving the point that combination therapy is effective. And the value of uh, low dose combination, again to re-emphasize the point that combining combining drugs from different classes is five times more more effective lowering of blood pressure than doubling the dose of one drug. Again, I just wanted to re-emphasize the point that the mechanism when you try to uh, um, address mo most of the mechanisms for control of hypertension. Combination therapy is is found to be very useful, and we also know from a variety of studies. If you start looking at this, the LHAD, the UKPDS, ABCD, where the enlapril is also used, the HOT, IED, ID, NT, and all this, as you, I mean, uh, the, uh, the 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 need for achieving target blood pressure depend was actually dependent on the number of drugs, and the higher the number of drugs that we use, the target blood pressures were uh, were achieved achieved. I mean, the control was achieved better with the uh, with the different agents. So, uh, so much so, after all this, the JNC seven came out with the conclusion that is perhaps the first time where the considering initiation of therapy in hypertension, uh, when you wanted a blood pressure reduction of more than twenty bar ten, uh, and even in stage one patients with high risk, the the op option of combined combination therapy was actually mooted by the JNC seven long ago. This was in 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 two thousand three. Of course, we had a long period in between. But there was no guidelines, and we all know what happened when the JNC8 came in. There was a lot of criticism by way uh, the guidelines were published, and subsequently the the American Society guidelines came, and then it all became a big confusion afterwards. But let us also look into the newer data. The sprint is not new, relatively new. Here they had an intensification, intensified control versus a, 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 a relatively lesser control, and again to achieve the systolic blood pressure for more than 140. Uh, you needed two drugs, and for three drugs were required if you wanted to bring down the blood pressure to less than 120. And we all know the the outcome of this. When the systolic blood pressure was brought down to less than 120, the benefits were very clear: 33 percent reduction in MI, congestive heart failure, in in, in the uh, coronary events as well as the uh, the coronary mortality. And there was a remarkable 25 percent reduction in mortality. Of course, there are a lot of other things that people. Uh, kept arguing about why the the whether it is a recording of the blood pressure which was very important but again the point was this print again showed that combination therapy was effective and not only that it was very well tolerated the only area where made a, uh, a where in the 
frail old patients and people in the nursing homes and elderly where one has to be really careful when you put these patients on combination therapy and even at at higher dosage so again going back what are the combinations that you would try because we have lot of data on the combination of ace and diuretic the preferred ones are the ace calcium channel blockers the ace and the uh, uh, you know diuretics the ace or the uh, uh, i mean the beta blockers and the diuretic and so on so the ace and the diuretic i'm not going to each study we all know that the progress high weight and all this are remarkable if you see the blood pressure reduction was uh, not that high but then the remarkable reduction in outcomes like the strokes the cardiovascular events and all that and of course angiotensin receptor blocker also scope again a 26% reduction in stroke which is much more than what atenolol could offer so the uh, other thing is a combination of calcium channel blocker with diuretic which i had shown earlier the accomplished trial was one of the major trials which showed again this again showed a 27% reduction in cardiovascular events and uh the combination of calcium channel blocker plus diuretic combination also did show some difference but though i have my own reservations about this combination of a calcium channel blocker and a diuretic there was a, in the at least in the elderly age group there there was showed a significant decrease in the events but then it was not very very clear in two studies which came out the value again showed only about 3 minus 3% reduction in coronary events what about the combination of beta blocker plus diuretic in fact one of the earliest drugs which was studied in this was the beta blocker but then uh, initially the studies because this was actually compared with a placebo that is the most important thing the initial studies where beta blocker came in in the treatment of hypertension was with placebo you could see the elderly hypertensive the, the systolic in isolated systolic hypertension all this it was showed a remarkable effect when it was compared with placebo but as in as the newer agents came in you could see the comparison with the as the arbs and you could see on the right hand side that there was not a significant difference Uh, in the in the live study and that is what pushed beta blockers away there was a 26% increase in the stroke because the central aortic blood pressure was not controlled so again the ascot again proved the point so i think go initially if you we were to compare with placebo beta blocker is a good choice even in combination but then with the newer agents it does not really in an uncomplicated hypertension one cannot really suggest a beta blocker so the uh, so finally the combination of an ace and a calcium channel blocker this is what where we have the maximum evidence the best comp- sort of combination which started with and uh, the the cyst euro and the cyst EU, i mean china study but eventually what really showed the difference was the ascot and the accomplish where they they showed a remarkable reduction in cardiovascular events particularly those hypertensives with risk factors so i think what has really shown us what has stood the test of time or with the kind of evidence that we have is a combination of an ace inhibitor arb with a calcium channel blocker so the possible combinations because of all this the esc came out with a with a with a um, uh, suggestion which is known to everyone what you see in the uh, dotted ones are something which you can combine and only word of caution is never to use a combination of an ace with an arb though initially this was tried but all the uh, all the trials and all the guidelines today are very clear cut that when you combine an ace and an arb you will have a very high chance of a renal dysfunction and that is actually contraindicated by most of the guidelines today so the preferred combination today as per the as per the data that we have is either a the preferred one is an ace or a diuretic arb or a diuretic ace with a calcium channel blocker and arb calcium channel blocker again you are not supposed to combine a renin inhibitor along with an ace or an arb so the what is seen acceptable you can use a beta blocker plus diuretic but today a calcium channel plus diuretic these are all options but then the best option is what you see on the left hand side and what is unacceptable which i again want to reinforce the point is the combination of ace and arb renin inhibitors they are no no longer effect used used in practice and of course once in a while you have a very high blood patient with a very high blood pressure combining a centrally acting agent with a with a beta blocker is okay not a not a very good option so the drug combination you can also choose based on the based on the uh, compelling indication for example you may have to use beta blocker when somebody has an ischemic heart disease again a diabetic substrate would be an ace and arb plus a calcium channel blocker same thing with the dyslipidemia in heart failure which i am sure we will have a panel discussion that i don't want to spend too much of a time but then one area where beta blockers could even the newer generation beta blockers which have not been studied in detail we have lot of studies which have been published from india also the indian hypertensives particularly the young hypertensives have high sympathetic activity and so a beta blocker perhaps may be effective in this group of patients again the the white coat hypertension elderly hypertensives again the combination arb or ace with the calcium channel blocker or even a diuretic could be the could be more like it 
and this is essentially what we have seen even in india so much so the guidelines in our country also uh, suggest almost the same thing that you could use a combination with any of the above agents so the combination since we had lot of lot of data from coming from different studies the esc guidelines in 2018 as initial therapy they recommended that calcium is arb plus calcium channel blocker or diuretic could be used the acc in the similar things i mean canadian guidelines and of course we have, as i had shown earlier indian guidelines is also uh, almost the same thing i just want to take you into something new which has come in i have been talking about all, all this old data for a long time what was interesting about this is, is this is actually a very large kind of patient population this is in a place called lombardy in in, in italy for a different reason now this area is by the covid you people would have known about this place but then somewhere nearby this is actually a very large 10 million population out of which they have about 2 million hypertensives very high percentage of hypertensives there and there they actually looked at what is happening in fact this is something like your swedish registry where every patient has their data in their in their in their in their national national headquarters so the here what is interesting is that when they tried looked at the what you see on the left hand side is the is the uh, uh, is the treatment strategy which which favored it so if we a monotherapy versus a combined therapy they what they found was a combination therapy was found to be very successful in bringing down blood pressure and not only that these patients were followed up for a, a, every year for a period of 3 years and what they found was that with a monotherapy and combination therapy any cardiovascular events or heart failure particularly so you look at what this is much more on the left hand side a combination therapy worked wonders in the prevention of cardiovascular events heart failure cerebrovascular disease ischemic heart disease and death so and if you look at the any event for example whether it's a stroke atrial fibrillation or heart failure all these things made a remarkable effect even these patients were followed up on a combination therapy again they also looked at the prescription patterns what you see on uh, on the uh, the dark shade is a combination therapy versus is the monotherapy and again what is very impressive in another study which was done nearby also we again showed the same thing the cardiovascular events the like ischemic heart disease cerebrovascular heart failure atrial fibrillation everything was remarkably less when these people were on a combination therapy and they went one step further also started looking at what would happen how they should target these patient population so if they had a combination therapy free combination therapy it was better but then once they made it a single combination bp control was even far better so the message is that it's not only the combination therapy but also the compliance which matters which actually improves with a with a single pill combination so so much so the all the new guidelines today actually have started in fact brian williams who was part of the guidelines from the european society so he came he was actually a, a, one of the major persons pushing this combination therapy and what there was a study which was done in nhs it also shows that the compliance as well as a patient ad, ad, adherence and response rates are far better with a with a combination therapy i think this is something which is relatively new the 2020 hypertension guidelines of the global hypertension practice guidelines this is basically for uh, one is an optimal or an essential they have made it a very different this thing what is essential for a country like india they were particularly particularly looking at a, a, a low income group country like india where they also feel that you need much more much better studies to really address our our population the as the optimal would be a step one is a combination of very low dose combination for example small dose combination of a calcium channel blocker or a very small dose combination of an ac with arb and then if they are not controlled on that go to a second step where you use a full dose combination and then if it's not controlled further go to a triple drug and then of course if you need an mri as a, as a, for a resistant hypertension you could do so so i think this is one of the favored things which they have, which they have suggest in in the african countries and also countries in the asia particularly in india china and the uh, eastern uh, southeastern part of the country I mean the world so the initial fixed dose combination has some advantages uh, low dose of two drugs are more effective better tolerated less adverse effects but there are also disadvantages particularly the sprint group i told you about the elderly in the frail population where two potent hypotension likely they can have more fractures and you know more renal dysfunction which i'm sure dr paul will address a little later on the simplified treatment algorithm and less adherence less healthcare cost so they eventually the adherence to therapy becomes becomes much better with an initial dose so that's why the initial the core drug treatment strategy for uncomplicated hypertension today would look like that as arb a calcium channel blocker or diuretic and then the step 2 is a triple combination and that is to reinforce if you have a resistant hypertension one would add a spironolactone along with that so the benefits are as mentioned earlier complementary mode of action 
synergistic effects, fewer side effects, patient compliance, and superior blood pressure reduction. So I would like to end my talk by saying that starting therapy with combination therapy has become, has become an accepted way of treating hypertension, more so even in the low middle income group with the kind of guidelines that is available today. If the blood pressure is in the moderate to severe degree, more than one would definitely be required. But even in, in mild hypertensives, today we have the guideline suggestion where you can use a low dose of both because that will that will do very well. And a polypill would help us in better drug compliance. For higher risk patients, it gets controlled better, can often use lower doses. There's a better control for blood pressure, better tolerability. And uh, for a general practitioner or for a physician, again, the message is clear. Your first shot is always the best shot and the patient compliance will be far better with this kind of therapy. I would like to end it on a note, uh, on a note of humor where I would suggest that combination, it's not just a blood pressure, it's not just numbers alone, but also you need to look into the high cholesterol, high blood pressure, anxiety, and getting high is no fun at any age. So I think it's very important that you keep everything together, have a holistic approach to bring uh, a combination of everything for control of blood pressure better. Thank you all for the kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Jagopal, for your wonderful deliberation. And it's really very uh, exciting to uh, understand the different uh, role of different uh, combination therapies, which you have already discussed in detail. And as in, in our clinical practice also, we, we all see that you know, combination therapies are having better compliance for the patient as well. And in country like us, where you know, patients are not very eager to take multiple pills, it's a very good option for all of us as well. And particularly as those who are having you know, moderate to severe hypertension. So it's a very good combination. Therapy is a very good option for all of us in the coming days. And you have already discussed the details of those. Now the session is open for any comments and discussions. I invite the audience if they have any comments. Uh, Dr. Ajay, what we'll do is uh, we'll uh, uh, introduce, I'll introduce the panelists now. Okay, sir. And uh, I'll ask a few questions and we'll take up in between whatever comes. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. It's in the chat box. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, I would like to, you know, we have fortunate to have uh, an eminent panel with us to discuss various issues. And uh, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. T.T. Paul, uh, Dr. Shiva Prasad, Dr. Pramila Kalra, Dr. Sanjeev Patak with us. And uh, uh, let me start to introduce a uh, few in brief, then we'll go to the Questions. Dr. Shiv Prasad, uh, uh, MD in medicine, DM in cardiology, senior intervention cardiologist, and HOD at LFP Medical College. He has a large teaching experience uh, in the background, the executive committee member of uh, CSI and ICCK, life member of IMA, CSI, and CSI Kerala, member of Indian College of Cardiology, Kerala, and National, CSI Kerala chapter treasurer, recipient of Vasudeva Award and has many publications to his uh, credit in various journals. Next, uh, Dr. T.T. Paul, uh, MD in medicine, MNAMS in nephrology, senior consultant nephrologist in uh, West Fort High Tech Hospital, Tishur, Kerala. He has been instrumental in starting uh, dialysis centers and uh, transplant centers in Kerala, and large uh, uh, number of uh, kidney transplant cases in his uh, experience, recipient of Dronacharya Award and scientific editor of Saudi Journal of Kidney Disease and Transplantation. He was organizing secretary for the Nephrology Conference in 2007 and the former president of the Nephrology Association of Kerala. Nice to have you, Dr. Paul. Next. And uh, my pleasure again to introduce Dr. Pramila from uh, my place that is Bangalore. Uh, MD and DM in endocrinology, FSC and MAMS. She is at present professor and consultant endocrinologist at Ramaya Medical College and Hospital Bangalore. Member of various endocrinology societies, um, 42 scientific publications in national and international journals, and a lot of presentation at the national and international conferences. And last, many awards, and she got last award on Space Award in 2017. Next. Dr. Sanjeev Pathak, uh, MD and PGDDM from UK, 
He is a diabetologist and metabolic physician at Ahmedabad. He is the founder of uh, Vijayaratna Diabetes Diagnosis and Treatment Center. He is associated as an investigator and consultant with DHL Research Center, Ahmedabad. First one to practice insulin pump therapy. The director of Jugadar Diabetes Association, Ahmedabad. Joint Secretary of uh, Diabetes Association, Ahmedabad. President of APA, principal investigator in many clinical trials involving diabetic population. I've been heavily invited as speaker in various uh, conferences. So with the brief introduction of the uh, panel, I'll start the, the ball rolling with a few questions. We already, uh, since we heard the combination pill and single uh, fixed combination, uh, I'll start with uh, both uh, uh, combination pill or combination therapy for hypertensives in diabetic population. Dr. Pramila of yours and then Dr. Sanjeev Patek. Dr. Pramila? Yeah. So combination therapy as because if you, uh, if you see if you see patients with diabetes, most of these patients, uh, they will require at least two drugs for control of hypertension. And uh, most of our patients, like initially, obviously, I will start them with an ARB or ACE, one of that. And along with that, most of many of them will require either a calcium channel blocker or uh, a diuretic because if you know, what we data we saw and what the trials have also shown that we need to have a good control of uh, hypertension in diabetes otherwise the risk of nephropathy and cardiovascular disease all is more so to achieve that what we see in our practice and what the studies have also shown that combination therapy is a good option it helps in three four ways one is like we say that when we treat diabetes we use drugs which target multiple pathophysiology and that's the rationale of using combination drug and same thing holds good for antihypertensive drugs as well. It reduces the pill burden as well because if we, if in, we use fixed dose combinations because in diabetic patients already they have so many drugs like anti-diabetic medications, statins. Alongside with that, they have hyperten antihypertensives and they have many more for neuropathy. They might, might be taking some drugs. So it reduces the pill burden, increases the compliance and also gives us a good control of hypertension. So that way combination therapy is a good option in diabetic patients especially the ARB and CCBs or ARBs with diuretics, that's the common ones used. And if they have cardiovascular disease, then beta blockers are indicated for them. Thank you. Dr. Sanjeev, would you like to add anything to this, uh, what has been said? I think I'll entirely agree with uh, Dr. Premila. Uh, in all the diabetic patients, we start with the combination because when diabetic patient comes to you with hypertension, uh, there are multiple pathophysiologies just like in diabetes. So we need to address them. And the ideal combination, again, as Dr. Pramila said, maybe ACE or ARB with CCB. As a diuretic combination with ARB or ACE, I prefer less because these days we also give SGLT2 inhibitors to most of the patients. So that diuretic uh, work is already done by those SGLT2s. So there's no additional benefit by giving diuretic. That's the perspective. Uh, the diabetes trials also have shown clearly and the ADA guidelines also show that more than 160, 90, they require combination therapy. But I would go to the extent that any patient who is diagnosed to have hypertension with diabetes has to be on combination. If time permits, I would like to add one trial. I think Dr. Uh, Jaigopal mentioned also, it was a wonderful talk, Dr. Jaigopal. The Triumph trial done by Sri Lankan people and that also showed that whether diabetic or non-diabetic, the early combination achieves better control in our Asian patients. I think that is uh, one of the proof for our Asian patients. So I'm very much in for the combination. Thank you. Um, we'll move to the uh, field of nephrology. Dr. Paul, sir, uh, would you like to add something more in your patient, your type of patients? What are the preferred combinations and any limitations on the use of diuretics? and combination of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. We'd like to say a few words on that. Yes. <laughs> As you know that it is um, in the field of nephrology, hypertension is almost always there and it's more difficult to control. Our problem, not problem, you know, one of, most of the patients, by the time they really come to us, you know, most of them are on diuretic for one reason or the other. So. Knowingly, inadvertently, advertently, they, these people are on diuretics right from the beginning. But coming to think about the what medicines to give, now the renoprotective properties of AC inhibitors and the ARBs are now well known and accepted. 
Albeit there is a problem because uh, a few percentage of patients can have a rise of creatinine. But here I would like to make a point that a small rise of creatinine is not dangerous. I've seen people uh, discontinuing ARBs and AC inhibitors the moment there is a, some a slight rise. But if you, uh, there are evidence, evidence now that if they continue with those people who had a rise of creatinine, which actually shows that the intra nephron, I mean, intraglomerular hypertension is controlled. That is why the creatinine goes up. In the long term, they do tend to do better with the progress of their renal failure. One other problem that we face uh, is when we add uh, uh, calcium channel blockers, because they have a tendency for uh, developing edema a little more than the rest of the people. But then, as I said earlier, they are almost all of them are on diuretics and we are able to get away with it when we need it. One, one medicine uh, that we also tend to use, which has not been come in this discussion at, at, at all, is uh, clonidine because beta blockers in terms of patients who are on dialysis and all. Uh, it is a bit of a problem for us because it tends to produce left ventricular failure. So in nephrology, our problems are that we have a combination of diuretics and one other drug and then supplemented by a calcium channel blockers like everybody else does. Uh, clonidine, if it is needed, otherwise uh, most of the people do very, very well with these combinations. Most of our patients are on two, three drugs at least. Uh, first of all, uh, this, uh, the use of diuretics, probably if the EGFR is uh, less than 30, then some of the thiazide and the thiazide-like diuretics are of no use, isn't it? Yes, that's right. In fact, uh, well, uh, I mean, I must say that it is not unknown, but interstitial nephritis due to lastics is well known. And the thiazide diuretics is also uh, known to produce, there is a tendency for them to produce hyperuricemia. As we all remember, this was marketed as Acetrex long time ago during our student days. And it went out of favor, uh, thiazide diuretic, because of the other effects and also a wee bit of a diabetogenic uh, incidence on that. That was described that time. But now it has come back in a big way. So, so thiazide diuretics are uh, to be used. And as you know, uh, chlorothalidone probably is a better uh, the, uh, drug. But then, as you mentioned, if the creatinine goes up, you know, these days it is classified into sta five stages of CKD. So if it is more uh, high, higher than CKD3, diuretics really doesn't do. But I see a lot of people still using it, but it is the benefit of that is doubtful. But in, in a country like India where dialysis uh, is gets initiated very late, people tend to use uh, diuretics for whatever benefit with some well-known uh, bad effects of the drug also. But uh, ideally, less than 30% of uh, creatinine clearance uh, diuretics will not really help very much. That is true. Yeah. And we have to use the loop diuretics. Now we'll move on to the field of uh, heart failure, uh, where uh, people are already on a number of drugs and are adding more and more drugs now to the management of heart failure. So where, what do you see the position of combination therapy and what are the problems in heart failure, Dr. Shiva Prasad? Thank you, Sir Ingar, Sir. And uh, let me first congratulate uh, Jay Gobal, Sir, for the excellent presentation. Now, you know that uh, I would like to explain the, the effects of hypertension and heart failure through uh, slides. This hypertension, as you know, is the single most important cause of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. With worldwide, these about 7.5 million events occur per year due to hypertension and heart-related problems. There is increased chance of ischemic heart disease, almost six times the risk of MI, atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmias, and heart failure. If you take the Framingham Heart Study, which is one of the uh, epidemi largest epidemiological follow-up studies of 6,859 patients on follow-up who were no disease at the beginning, if their blood pressure was above 130-85 as compared to the patients who had a normal blood pressure, they had three times the higher likelihood of developing cardiovascular disease. 
and in 2008 there was a meta analysis involving nearly 1.9 lakh patients showed that 30% of the hypertensive patients develop heart failure as they uh, advance into hypertensive stages this happens so in elderly population blacks and diabetics and also with the other high risk features and if you take the evolution of heart failure and hypertension it is because of the left ventricular hypertrophy diastolic dysfunction then progresses to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction subsequently it turns out to be a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and it is said that new onset heart failure occurs with the inc incidence of 11 to 48% and if you take hypertension about nearly 70 as high as 75% of them will have associated heart failure so control what is proven is the fact that if you control the hypertension properly it provides benefits in terms of reduction of the cardiovascular events in both low and the high risk groups if you take the famous sprint trial if you strictly control the blood pressure systolic blood pressure below 120 you can achieve a 38% reduction in the cardiovascular events the classical text are used in the context of heart failure with hypertension for control of hypertension is aci inhibitors aci inhibitors or arbs if they are not tolerated beta blockers mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist and if the blood pressure is not controlled with these drugs you can add on calcium channel blockers and of course diuretics are important in reducing the symptoms the first three class of drugs are known to reduce the even rates and mortality in heart failure and hypertension combination it is said that if you can reduce the blood pressure by 10 mm of mercury of in systolic blood pressure cardiovascular disease even rate reduction is to the tune of 12% and what should be the optimal blood pressure in these patients the optimized heart failure trial showed that the elevated blood pressure compared to the lower blood pressure range with treatment increased the mortality in lower blood pressure range whereas a little elevated blood pressure reduced the hospital mortality rates the same was found in the meta analysis of 8000 patients with higher systolic pressure yield and better outcome copernicus and cham studies come also revealed that the effect is good in low blood in the group in which you were bring brought down the blood pressure but it was found that the benefit was maximum in the group where the blood pressure was maintained somewhere around 130 to 140 the paradigm heart failure trial i want to see little elaborate on this this is the trial which compared the various blood pressure levels in paradigm heart failure trial in which it is shown that if you have the blood pressure range between 110 and 120 and 120 to 130 you can see that it below 120 and above 140 the effect is less compared to a blood pressure which is achieved between 120 to up to 140 so we should be targeting it is our primary end point cardiovascular death heart failure hospitalization all cause death all these parameters were better if you maintain the blood pressure between 120 to 140 so that should be this also is another graph which shows this is based on a korean study of acute heart failure and chronic heart failure there also you can see that as we believe that there is a j shape curve for hypertension in heart failure also hypertension with heart failure also if you reduce the blood pressure in high in the lower blood pressure in below 110 there is increase in event rates above 140 there is increase in event rates you can see that this is in all population in reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction so much so that we can conclude that treating hypertension has major impact in reducing the incident heart failure and heart failure hospitalizations blood pressure blood pressure should be lowered if it is more than 140 90 your target should be less than 130 by 80 but it should be kept above 120 70 renin angiotensin receptor blockers and ac inhibitors are the first class of drugs which are to be used probably in combination with the beta blockers and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists this will improve the clinical outcome in patients with established heart failure whereas diuretics are limited for symptomatic improvement as i said stated earlier calcium channel blockers are added if you think that your blood pressure control is not proper those patients who are taking arni for heart failure that should be continued but it is also extended that heart failure with 
preserved junction fraction also you can continue army to improve the renal outcome and their symptom status but no mortality benefit has been proved except probably in women where the symptomatic improvement the reduction in the renal failure renal uh, function deterioration thank you thank you dr shiv prasad uh, now we will move a little away from the combination therapy uh, uh, dr sanjeev would you like to say something about the present role of beta blockers because they have not done very well in the field of hypertension like to say a few words on beta blockers yes sir uh, beta blockers theoretically because they do not reduce the morbidity or mortality in patients with hypertension when used for hypertension so unless patient has congestive heart failure or is having a post mi without that giving beta blocker at present has become less favorable and they are not preferred as first second or third line therapy they are usually fourth line therapy having said that many of our patients in real world do not do well without beta blockers probably they have more increased sympathomimetic activity even being diabetic though our first drug of choice is arb plus uh, ccb but uh, time and again many of them they need beta blockers of course we use cardio selective beta blockers there but uh, in real world as i said beta blockers so not favored Uh, according to the clinical trials but we have to use in several patients to reduce the heart rate and to control the blood pressure because probably increased sympathomimetic activity or anxiety may be playing an important role in this so to address that pathophysiology i think beta blockers still have some role to play in the management of hypertension thank you dr shiva uh J Jay Gopal would like to add something uh, on the use of beta blockers. Uh, Jay like, Gopal, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. I think this is very relevant, particularly in the Indian context. In fact, there's a study which is published on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring from India. Yeah. Anybody else would like to add? Yeah, on eighteen thousand patients, where uh, it's seen that we all have a very high sympathetic drive, you know, and so they would. I mean, in the suggestion is that you use a beta blocker at bedtime, and particularly the newer ones like the. the bisoprolol or the carbidolol and unfortunately these agents have not been tested in large numbers and not been compared with the calcium blocker one so it's only the atinal or which is the villain so we, we still do not know yeah. so there's still a role for beta blockers i agree with dr sanjeev that you know we we tend to use in a large proportion of our patients just a word about uh, uh, the there's a new entity called heart failure with the recovered ejection fraction i think that's something which is very uh, really catching up most of the hypertension subset i am i am sure dr paul would also agree with me a lot of people who come with an accelerated hypertension the lb is very bad 30% 20% you control the hypertension well within 2 months the lb is near near normal boom boom and then question is whether you need to continue all your army your uh, ac inhibitor so there is some data saying that you know these people do well once you continue that and also about army in the as a management for hypertension this is a trial for the parameter trial So we are in our right for a year. So something new which you are getting to see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, coming, continuing with beta blockers. I think there is some place when uh, people with pregnancy, pregnant ladies, uh, Dr. Pramila, uh, the drugs you use in pregnancy. See, preg. Uh, as an endocrinologist, if we, I will see pregnancy, I will see mostly the women who are GDM or type two diabetes and have conceived and have concomitant hypertension. Now we have two categories. Like one is a pre-gestational hypertension, and one is a gestational hypertension. Now, if it's a pre-gestational hypertension, if they have already had hypertension before twenty weeks of gestation and it continues six weeks postpartum, then we call them as pre-gestational hypertension, and they are the ones who are already on, in follow-up with us for diabetes as well. and then there is all is gestation hypertension which mostly goes to the gynecologists until unless they have gdm and they come to us so they develop hypertension after 20 weeks of gestation and they continue and they they their hypertension uh, improves or they become normal at 6 weeks postpartum so the ones which we see mostly are the pre gestational hypertension with diabetes so most of these patients we have to take a call first thing is if a woman is planning for a child we have to see that if she is on ace or arbs we have to stop before she plans for a child because they they are shown to have teratogenic side effects so all these and uh, many of them are on calcium channel blockers which we continue but the ace or arbs we stop 
if either is or a r b but if a woman has uh, pregnancy and is a diabetic and is hypertensive we also have the choice of drugs like methyl dopa or labetalol which are the options for uh, gestational hypertension we also have the option of nifedipine now the other drugs are lower down the list like even uh, people have tried there are some uh, studies with prazosin as well clonidine as well but the common drugs which are used are like um, if she is on nifedipine it's okay calcium channel blocker is fine and as or arb is to be stopped for sure before she plans for a child because they have definite teratogenic side effects and then we can the drugs of choice are like methyl dopa and uh, uh, labetalol these are the ones which are commonly used so labetalol is quite useful in managing the patients uh, with pregnancy and hypertension um, continuing on those contraindication for as in pregnancy and arb is was uh, pregnant Uh, Dr. Shivata would like to Shivata and Dr. Paul can take up this contraindications to use of ACE inhibitors in ARBs in your practice. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you, sir. Uh, these are very useful agents as we have seen, uh, and most of the recommendations are to start with one of the ACE inhibitors, or if not already to the ARBs. But uh, most uh, there exist uh, certain real contraindications to start these drugs. One is a patient with a bilateral renal artery stenosis, or a patient with single kidney with the renal artery disease, or a patient who has a potassium value above 5.5. And uh, pregnancy is a contraindication to use AC inhibitors because a lot of uh, skeletal abnormalities and uh, even fetal loss can occur with use of AC inhibitors in pregnancy. and uh, a small percentage of patients who uh, gave history of angioedema either idiopathic or hereditary or those who had an exposure to ac inhibitors earlier with a history of angioedema definitely these are the set of patients who are likely to get this angioedema again and which could be fatal as well so angioedema is a contraindication bilateral renal artery stenosis is a specific contraindication pregnancy and potassium value above 5.5 and if you take a relative contraindication we can say severe aortic stenosis with hypertension maybe that is a contraindication because of the uh, sudden fall in the cardiac output because of the vasodilatation which can occur and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy where also vasodilatation is not preferred these are relative contraindications one surprising thing is renal dysfunction is not considered as an absolute contraindication we can even start with up to 3 uh, creatinine as a cardiologist we start with of course with the concern of the nephrologist but i see nephrologists use uh, these drugs uh, even when the creatinine is uh, about 5 6 i have seen people using it i think my, i welcome opinion from paul sir about regarding this and uh, i think these drugs these are the definite contraindications to start these drugs but one other point which i want to mention here is now because of the covid uh, there came an impression that uh, we should not be using these drugs in covid patients because the covid uh, if they get involved with covid the disease is going to be very severe and they are going to have more complications of covid related mortality but uh, if you think that um, uh, if this is this came from the fact that the covid virus gets into the body to ace2 receptors this is entirely different from uh, our ac1 and receptors which we are talking about and the point that ac inhibitors are going to increase the levels of ac thereby increase in the chance of covid infection these are certain evidences which came from limited animal studies no human studies have proved that ac2 receptor upregulation with use of aci inhibitors so most of the studies have shown that even in the covid patients it is shown that the the use of ac inhibitors actually will uh, reduce the use of ac inhibitors will actually help in uh, the use of ac inhibitors they are is actually produce a better outcome in covid patients this is a recent meta analysis which was published uh, just two months ago in march uh, in chest all the ac inhibitors uh, are producing the uh, improved survival and they are also not those high density patients who develop covid if they are on ac inhibitors or arbs that drugs are, need to be continued and you need not get anxious about the continuation of these drugs because they are proven to be safe in the context of covid thank you
Thank you, Dr. Jayaprakash. Just want to mention about the uh, pregnancy, those ACE inhibitors, ARB is contraindicated, but during lactation, you can use an drug which is least excreted in the breast milk. Yeah. So it could be used. Yeah. And the contraindications to ACE inhibitor uh, ARBs, Dr. Pop, he wanted your help in uh, using this in patients with raised creatinine. Yes, uh, I think most of the points have been already uh, covered by the previous uh, Dr. Shiv Prasad. Uh, we also tend to use uh, um, ARBs and AC inhibitors. These days, more ARBs. Uh, but I want, one point I want to make is that, you know, that, that these are also drugs that are indicated to be used uh, with patients with proteinuria because they are also known as anti proteinurics. So there are a group of patients, you know, sometimes uh, um, some diabetic patients, who, although most of them are hypertensive, but there are people with proteinuria who are not hypertensive. And uh, there is, it, it is recommended to use uh, AC inhibitors or uh, even if they are not hypertensive. Of course, you have to keep a watch on that. But the more important point here is uh, watching on the serum potassium because uh, if, if you are not careful about uh, the dietary restriction of potassium for our patients, then uh, a, 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 some people can lose their lives, you know, because uh, uh, it is yeah, usually under under diagnosed because many play places, uh, electrolytes are not done on a routine and things like that. So apart from that, as I mentioned earlier, it, that uh, uh, even if uh, creatine is slightly raised, if you start the medicine and there is a slight rise of creatinine, do not panic unless it keep on rising. And the con and the contraindications, as I mentioned, as he, uh, Dr. Prasad mentioned earlier, you know, it's the renal artery stenosis, single kidney with the renal artery disease. These are all well well known. Apart from that, for the most of the people, this is on the long term, it is found to be beneficial. At least we do not have any other pro more protective medicines than this right now. So therefore, I think uh, there definitely uh, it is not a, a touch me not uh, type of drug even for people who have got raised creatinine. We use that on dialysis patients also because there is no further kidney to get damaged. But hyperkalemia there also is a problem. Um, beta blockers at this moment, if I can say that, you know, one thing is that, you know, the economic factors, I, I, I still use ethanol, although it is an old-fashioned drug because of some of the patients. The good advantage of ethanol is that purely excreted by the kidney. So once you give a small tablet, a small dose, you know, 25 milligram or 50 milligram at the end of dialysis, that stays in the body till the next dialysis. So the cost factor is very, probably justifies uh, medicines in, at least in those patients who cannot um, you know, afford the other type of expensive medicines. So there is, I cannot say that it is totally contraindicated in patients with uh, renal failure, everybody uses it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, this point where yeah, one more, one more uh, contraindication is uh, in combination with aliscarin. Uh, you should not be using AC inhibitors. That uh, Dr. Jacobal has mentioned already. Yeah, it's still anyway is not available. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the point where we left off from COVID, recently is one the randomized control trial which was done called Brace Corona, where there's one group of patients, nearly 600 patients, they stopped their AC inhibitors and ERBs for 30 days during the COVID. They were admitted with COVID. And other group, they continued with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And they didn't find any difference. So even if he's off, ACE inhibitors and ARBs didn't make any difference. This is a randomized control trial presented in the ESC. So they say, what they say, conclusion, you should continue the drugs. It doesn't cause any harm. So that is one thing about the COVID. Um, anybody else would to add anything? Uh, Coming to the choice of diuretics, you know, we have these uh, short-acting thiazide diuretics. We have uh, thyroidone and we have nepamine. So even could mention what is his choice of diuretic in treating his hypertensive patients. Starting with the lady, Dr. Vanilla. Yeah, most of the times in our patients, uh, 
most of the combinations which are available with the ARBs are with the thiazide diuretics. So we do use uh, we do use thiazide diuretics in a lot number of our patients. Though to add here that hyponatremia is one something which we see in some of our older patients, which we have to be cautious about with the use of these drugs, because and chlorothiazide also we are using and we have data in diabetics with chlorothiazide as well. Indepamide is a very mild, uh, I would say, a diuretic sort of effect, and we do see we do use it in patients where we we don't want a typical diuresis effect, but we do get a good result with that. But what more we use is a thiazide diuretic or a chlorothaliridone thal type of diuretic in most of our patients. Though, as I said, uh, hyponatremia is something which we do see in lot of our older diabetic patients, and we do need to at least uh, do. The electrolytes when we follow them up, so that we get an idea about their sodium potassium. So that's one thing which we see. Dr. Sanjeev, uh, you are diabetic of your choice. Uh, well, my practice is mainly diabetic, and now most of the patients are now on SGLT2 inhibitors. So our diuretic use has gone down significantly. Not that they cannot be combined with uh, SGLT2, but. Uh, we have seen increased incidence of hyponatremia when SGLT2, when given in full dose, are combined with a diuretic. And the diuretic effect is already there with the SGLT2 inhibitor. So I would like to ask the panel that if SGLT2 is on board already, is there any role of a thiazide-like diuretic? Of course, with heart failure, we need to use a loop diuretic. But the role of thiazide diuretic as an antihypertensive when patient is already on an SGLT2 inhibitor. In my practice, the uh, thiazide use has gone down significantly after the SGLT2, but I would like to know from the expert panelists here uh, their views about that. And, sure, Prasad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors have come into the field of uh, diabetes management as well as the management of heart failure. So definitely it causes more uh, what diuresis and the requirement of diuresis need, diuretics need to be adjusted. And uh, you, you need not be giving the full dose of diuretics which we have been using in, in case we have not used SDLT2. And uh, these drugs, these new drugs have improved the survival and the heart failure hospitalizations, even in non-diabetics. So we recommend the use of uh, SGLT2 in heart failure now. With the DAPA heart failure trial and the empagliflozin trial, we are recommending both in non-diabetics also we are using, but it has not come in a big way in heart failure management alone without diabetes. But when you are using this drug, you have to step down on the treatment of diuretics and probably the thiazide requirement may come down. And then uh, Madam was mentioning about indepamide. Indepamide is a weak diuretic, but it is very potent in causing indolent hyponatremias. We have seen several almost near fatal cases of hyponatremia with uh, chronic use of indepamide, which is a very useful tablet. You say that it is lipid neutral, electrolyte neutral, but it is not electrolyte neutral. It causes indolent hyponatremia. But, yeah. uh, about uh, SPLT2, yeah. this is going to revolutionize the heart failure management along with other drugs. Uh, Dr. Jagopa, yeah. I think that's a very interesting question which Dr. Sanjeev brought in. I'm just going by data. See, the, uh, he was, Dr. Shiva Prasad was mentioning about the DAPA HF trial. Now, there, this is a, you must all understand that when you use an STL2, like your diabetes, there's a 3 kg loss of weight which is also attributable to the loss of body water or whatever. And that remains static. Over a period of time, this is not going to go down further. So what they found in, in DAPA heart of HF trial also, the, in fact, these are all state, there are two categories of patients, even heart failure. One with the acute heart failure, we, we are very clear that we don't want to use a DAPA HF. There, you know, your point is well taken. You use you, you, you as a diuretic, you will dehydrate the patient, you will have a renal setback, everything there. So we don't want to use this in the setting of an acute heart failure. But the upper HF and the other, even the empiric reduce, has all been from patients on stable heart failure. And what did they find? It's very interesting to note that the dosage of diuretics remained the same in, at, with the upper 10 milligram or empire 10 milligram, 10 milligram. So there was no need for a reduction of this thing in these both trials. Whether they had a diabetic subset or a non-diabetic, both has been compared. So it's very clear there. So the message is that down the line, if they're stable, 
and if the SGLT is really started setting in and the effect is stable over a period of one month, you you are safe to use it thiazine diuretic or whatever you want to. But the issue is that are we are we justified in using this hydrochlorothiazide along with this losartan, which ideally has to be used twice a day? You are combining with half a tablet of that in the morning. So I don't think it is justified. But all I think it's a chlorothalidone, which has got a relatively longer duration of action, and that is a preferred option. In the long run, you may not really have to come down on the dosage until unless you have a setting for a dehydration. That's that question. And the second thing is about intepamide. I think very valid point. I am very clear where I use this. I, these are a category of systolic hypertensive patients where it works very well. So you combine there with an AS, ARB, or whatever. And the diuretic effect is not much, but the systolic hypertension responds much better to this drug. And also, what we see in our hyper uh, diabetics when we start these SGLT2 inhibitors, especially the ones who already have a almost 120-80, in them sometimes we do reduce the dose of diuretic in the beginning because the moment we start the SGLT2 inhibitors, they come with complaints of postural giddiness and multiple issues, or little bit older patients who are little bit predisposed for falls, and we do want to give them the benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors. We tend to reduce the dose of diuretic when we are starting the SGLT2. Over a period of time, when we call them for follow up and then we see their blood pressure and how they are doing with the SGLT2, and if there's no postural drop and they are doing fine and the BP is going a bit high, then we um, create the dose of the diuretic back to the uh, to the dose what they were taking. This is how we do in most of our patients because we do see that the moment who are the best controlled on and diuretics and antihypertensives. And the moment we add these SGLT2 inhibitors, they do have a little bit of issues. So there we do this little bit of permutation combination for a short period, though we many a times the, uh, come back to the original dose of diuretic on follow-up. So what comes out of the discussion is this. I think uh, uh, the amongst the diuretics, preferably use the long-acting diuretics, clothalidone or in the pamine, but that's not feasible from an economic point of view or patient is already on short-acting uh, Thiazide age could continue that, but preferably CTD or uh, independent are the interests of choice as long as the diabetes is concerned. And patients who is on SGLT inhibitor is a clinical judgment. If BP is falling, if the patient is not tolerating it well, you can reduce the dose of diabetes. Uh, anything else would like to add? I think uh, we have enough time for some more questions. I think there's nothing in the uh, uh, I would like can I, can I make a comment? Chat? Yes, sir. Please. Quick yeah. comment and take chat <laughs> See, the, uh, our problem is that many of, many of our patients have creatinine clearance much uh, low by the time they reach to us. And SGL2 uh, inhibitors uh, are, are difficult to be used. So they, they don't um, work on renal tubules to excrete uh, the sugar as well as the normal people. But recently, there was uh, some talk about this DAPA glyphosate that can be used even if the creatinine is high. Um, DAPA glyphosate to be used even if they are not, di not diabetics. DAPA glyphosate can be used for heart failure. It has got renoprotective and cardioprotective. This. But I think probably we need some more time to definitely think about it. But I want to, I want to ask the panel that um, are, are you all using this for this other indication other than diabetic control? Yeah, at yeah. present, uh, sorry. At sorry. present, please, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, I, yeah. I, I, please go ahead, sir. Sorry. Ah, at present, uh, the indication is in diabetic population. The heart failure, we're expecting it to come uh, in line with the uh, ARNI, uh, beta blockers, and uh, MRAs. It will come as a treatment for heart failure in non diabetics And both empagliflozin and dapagliflozin have shown very impressive results in reduction in mortality, reduction in heart failure hospitalization, and the recurrent heart failure is very impressive results. I'm, I'm sure it will come in the guidelines shortly. As on today, it is not in the guidelines for treating uh, heart failure in non diabetic patients, but it will come. Now, Dr. Pat, want to add anything? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the data is quite an overwhelming data. So I think it's only a question of time before we start in heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction. But with the MPA, it's at slightly lower dosage. So it is just 10 milligram, whereas the diabetic dosage is 25. Whereas the DAPA, it is the same dosage. But I think one area where even in uh, preserved ejection fraction is one area where, you know, 
uh, today I think there's a little different concept about this uh, SGL2. You know, it's the sodium exchange system, whether it's the heart or in the kidney. So I think uh, there's a new, new thought process which is coming in that, you know, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction essentially is multiple comorbid conditions like your blood pressure, aging, so many things, distension and loss of left ventricular complaints. And what is interesting to note is that, you know, the, the accumulation of pericardial fat is supposed to reduce the complaints of the heart. So there is that, I think the STLT is supposed to act at that level. I don't know, this is something really interesting. So yeah. I think so, as an, there, you know, you want a little bit of a diuretic effect. You don't want too much of a diuretic in preserved ejection fraction. If you, if you bring down the preload drastically, benefits are lost. So you just want a reduction of heart rate, less diuretic, then maybe it's a, it's a good choice. But then not right. reduced ejection fraction, the problem is we initiate the multiple drugs and the cost, as you rightly said, Indian scenario, I don't know where we are heading to. Yeah, we combine yeah. tension. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah, you see the have... data from the DAMPAC CKD and all, they have used till EGFRs of 25. And even if we see all the other SGLT2 inhibitor trials, even with a lower EGFR of nearing 30, and even now till 20, we have the data. So what they have seen that the cardiovascular mortality is lowered, even at that lower EGFR, also it has shown a benefit. So it's only, I think, a matter of time one before our DCGI approves it because they are already in that process. It uh, already FDA has approved dapagliflozin for heart failure indication solo apart from the diabetes indication. And even at lower EGFRs, they have seen cardiovascular mortality benefits. So across those EGFRs also it works because previously we used to think that only till 45 it will show effect and below that the cardiovascular mortality benefit may not show up or the glycemic efficacy may not show up, but it, it showed. So that is what the we have seen across yeah, all yeah, the SGLT2 yeah. trials. It also slows the decline in uh, EGFR. Uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, would you like to add something uh, to this discussion before I take up? There are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, I think, sir, uh, the, the discussion was uh, absolutely very fantastic regarding the SGL2 inhibitors and, and the diuretic use. Uh, definitely, I just want to add it that in our patients of heart failure, those who are definitely on loop diuretic, adding on these SGL2 inhibitors uh, uh, gives us a lot of uh, scope to reduce our diuretic doses. And we should be very cautious among them. And these uh, definitely DAPA CKD trials, they have uh, you know, promoted us to start in patients who are having renal dysfunction as well, and their uh, GFR is less than 30 even, because before that, we were not using in, in those patients. And me and my nephrologic colleagues there, we are more confident in giving them these drugs also. So these are my personal uh, comments in, on this aspect. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Now, this question from the chat box, I'll just read out. Dr. Sanjay from Hyderabad, do you advise ARB replacement with CCBs? Um, I don't think there's any need. If he's well controlled and he's doing well with ARB, there's no need to replace with uh, CCB. Uh, Dr. Varsha from Mumbai, STEMI in this COVID era with a primary angioplasty is still preferred. Yeah, if you've got a dedicated cat lab to do COVID cases, you should do it. That still remains the primary uh, intervention for uh, uh, STEMI. If you can't, then of course you can thrombolize. Anybody would like to add something more to this I think answer? Do, uh, sir, can I? Yeah, please. Sir, I think early revascularization is the goal of uh, acute myocardial infarction STEMI management. Of course, but uh, the problem is you should have a dedicated cat lab with involvement of minimum persons to perform the procedure with uh, strict personal protection equipments available for all health workers who are involved. And also, if you think that the patient is at risk of any uh, cardiorespiratory arrest, they should be intubated before taken into the cath lab rather than making it a mess inside with a lot of aerosols. So we we do in LAP Medical College, we do primary angioplasties with uh, this intention. And if the patient is in cardiogenic shock or so, we take it, but with the intubation outside and take it inside and the procedure should be as brief as possible. And I think the, question. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is actually, you know, when these patients come to you, it's difficult to get an RT-PCR done or even a TrueNet done to wait for the no. cells to decide. So I think what we are doing is that we do a rapid antigen and then go ahead. And if, as you rightly said, sir, I think the key is the reperfusion. So there's nothing yes. like doing a prime family. So I think uh, most of us get to know about this COVID status the next day. You would have done a procedure and next day you get to know that this guy is positive. So that's a real headache for cardiologists. We, we, we 
we are blind we are blind to the blind to the status of covid uh, in these patients so as a policy all of us take all the extreme points of protection for the workers and we have seen that antigen test is uh, deceive you more than 40% of the time 40% of the time antigen negative you come next day with uh, covid positive even true yeah. antigen uh, yeah. is negative yeah. can be positive it is like an emergency procedure emergency surgery is the same procedures you have to follow the next question is any difference between essential hypertension and secondary hypertension if both are uncomplicated secondary hypertension you must detect and correct it so primary hypertension essential hypertension will need lifelong treatment uh, and secondary hypertension we have to rule out the causes like cushing syndrome or acromegaly yeah, yeah. Yeah, or pheochromocytoma uh, all these causes hyperaldo many endocrine causes cushing's can walk, be there so walk patient so they are yeah, so we have to treat all that yeah uh, uh, there is involvement of is two receptors is there any role of spironolactone in uh, don't understand probably in patient with covid and there no study is done but uh, Yeah, as the all the guidelines have recommended, all have agreed that if you can case inhibitors and DRBs, the patient is already on that. There is no need to stop. Uh, what about DPP four inhibitors in hypertension, Dr. Pamela and Dr. Sanjeev? Any role of DPP four inhibitors in hypertension? Uh, I think there is no direct role. The, uh -huh. the studies have shown that placebo detected blood pressure reduction of. One or two millimeter of mercury that is absolutely non-significant. So I don't think there is any any direct role of DPP-4 inhibitors for hypertension management. Yeah. So that's what because uh, DPP-4 inhibitors are cardio neutral. So overall, we can just say that they are just cardio neutral drugs can be used across. Except some data we have with saxagliptin with increased heart failure admissions. Otherwise, mostly they are cardio neutral. Hypertension, that blood pressure reduction, as Dr. Sanjeev rightly pointed out, it's very minuscule, so not so. Uh, clinically not so important. Uh, Dr. Avijay Saha from Malda, ideal top drawing for antihypertensive. I think the day you diagnose hypertension, you should get antihypertensives. Anybody would like to add? No, I think he's asking about the timing of drug administration. Bedtime dosing. Right. Bedtime dosing. Bedtime dosing. One. Bedtime dosing. That's that's yeah. an interesting. Evening, yeah. evening time or bedtime doses is yeah, correct. Perfect. Yeah. I think question. for Indian Just patients question. because we have significant nocturnal hypertension and morning surge, so for Indian patients, I think it is more relevant. Yeah. So bedtime only that you are giving two antihypertensives, at least one should be. No, no, uh, the idea yeah. is whether you should give the drugs in the morning or in the night. Because yeah. Because yeah. big field coming of so-called chronotherapy, chronobiotherapy. Now recently, one uh, randomized control trial again from Spain it has come out. Okay. We are trying, I think, uh, where they found went across <laughs> the ambulatory people monitoring before they were given these drugs. So they knew that these people are having nocturnal hypertension. So they gave it, and nearly fifty percent reduction in their cardiovascular outcome. So what I would suggest, of course, uh, most of the drugs we give are long acting; they act more than twenty-four hours. So ideally, is give it in the morning. But you have done. Uh, ambulatory PP monitoring. If he has got a nocturnal hypertension, there is no nocturnal dip. Then probably could introduce a drug at night. Any other comments? Uh, welcome. Yeah, I think the uh, the point that he was mentioning in Indians, we we find a very high blood pressure. In fact, the ABPM done on a large number of patients showed the same thing. That's perhaps the only area where a newer beta blockers could also be because the sympathetic overactivity is supposed to be the reason for that. Either an ARB at night or even a small dose of a uh, very selective ARB at night or even a small dose of a. Uh, yeah, that's right. Multiple drugs you could give one drug in the night, but uh, those people who have uh, marked an optional dip, will it be harmful in those patients? Yes, it's, it's debatable. I think we are not, we are not in a position to get the blood pressure. I mean, ABPM for every every patient. Yeah. Uh, US FDA alert on hydroxide causing non melanoma skin cancer. I think in our practice we are not seen with uh, for very long use. But if it is a thing, is better you shift to non thiazide like diuretics. 
I don't know whether it applies to other diabetics. Anybody else uh, has read about this? Non melanoma? Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a Medscape article on that and the US FDA alert has come. But uh, I don't think that in clinical practice after use of diuretic in so many patients, we have come across it. Such alarm. Uh, use of alpha blockers in uncontrolled hypertension as for the drug. I think we use it in very often in our patients, mostly the uh, CKD patients, Dr. Paul. Alpha yes, blockers. I mentioned that earlier. It is a very useful drug for us. Uh, albeit uh, it, it produces a bit of uh, sedative-like action it has, but um, we cannot go very high on um, beta blockers or any other medicines like that because of fear, fear of uh, uh, heart failure, I mean, left ventricular failure because uh, our kidneys are compromised. And also we cannot go on uh, AC inhibitors or ARBs for fear of hypertension, and uh, sorry, hyperkinemia. Uh, so I think it is a drug which, which is very much uh, useful for us, selectively. So I think it is uh, definitely useful and it is not very costly either. Yes. Same thing, I think the CKD and resistant hypertension roll out add-on drugs like tonidine, prazosine, and other options. We already mentioned about it. Yeah, I think with that, we come to the end of the questions. And uh, uh, Dr. Ajay, uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, would you like to sum up uh, before we end the session? I would like to thank uh, my co-chairperson and all the panelists for their excellent presentations and uh, question answer session. And I would request to Dr. Pandey to say a few. Uh, the audio video is fine. Yes. Dr. Ajay, you have to. Yes, the audio video is fine, sir. Oh, Dr. your video and audio. Uh, yeah, yeah, now am I audible? Yes. Thank you, Professor Aingar, sir. It was really an excellent uh, uh, panel discussion and uh, a talk by uh, our, our esteemed Professor Jay Gopalan. And uh, definitely our diabetology colleagues have added the, uh, the important aspects of uh, antihypertensive combination therapy in diabetic patients as well. So I think we all have enjoyed this evening and the combination of uh, drug therapy and antihypertensive medications. So I'm really thankful to everyone, as well as the audience, those who have made the session very alive by their enthusiastic questions and all. So thank you, IPCA people, for joining me. Thank you, Savanash from IPCA. Uh, say something before we close. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Once again, a very good evening to you all, respected faculties and viewers from Pan India. It was indeed a treat to listen to our honorable faculties on the topic of hypertension. They made the things so simple and lucid to understand the topic of day-to-day -day use, that is hypertension and its treatment. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ayangar, sir, for gliding this session so smoothly and sharing his expertise with us. Thank you so much, sir. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ajay Pandey, sir, for closing the session and sharing his vast experience and expertise. Thank you so much, sir, for chairing the session. Thank you, sir. Heartfelt thanks to Dr. Jay Gopal, sir, for wonderful presentation and topic, combination therapy. Thank you so much to you also, sir. And my heartfelt thanks to all our panelists for a second session that is hypertension treatment, what's new. Dr. Shiva Prasad, sir. Dr. Paul, sir. Dr. Pramila, ma'am. Dr. Sanju Fatak, sir, for sharing their expertise, experience, and their thoughts. Finally, I thank you all, dear viewers from all across the country for watching this webinar on this Saturday evening. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Stay well. Stay safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Sure, everyone. Thanks, Enjoy everyone. It. Bye. Yeah. Good Bye, night. Everybody. Good night. Enjoy the IPL match. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>